Four Meter Dive by Marty McCafferty, performed by Dr. Franz Cronier. The diver was a 19-year-old woman in good physical condition. She denied any history of medical problems and did not take any medications regularly. She completed her confined water training several weeks before with no problems and was now doing her open water training dives. The dives took place in South Florida. The diver was accompanied by her father, a certified diver with less than 100 lifetime dives. On the first day, the dives were uneventful, though the diver admitted to some anxiety related to being in open water and diving from a boat. None of the dives were deeper than nine meters, nor were they longer than 40 minutes. The diver successfully performed all the required skills and reported looking forward to completing a certification. On the second day, the dives were at a different location. The boat was anchored over a four meter deep sand bottom. The bottom sloped downwards to the reef, which was at a maximum depth of 11 meters. After they entered the water and began heading towards the reef, the diver's father and other witnesses reported that the diver appeared to be having difficulty with her equipment. Exactly what was wrong was never clearly established. Her movements became erratic and she seemed unaware of her buddy and the other divers. Within moments, she ascended quickly in an uncontrolled manner from four meters to the surface. Upon reaching the surface, she managed to struggle and did not establish positive buoyancy. Her father made a controlled ascent to the surface and was able to establish positive buoyancy for both of them. The diver had already abandoned a mask and regulator and was breathing rapidly. With aid from one of the dive guides, the pair returned to the boat. Aboard the boat, the diver was shaking and continued breathing rapidly. The crew examined her and she reported tingling in her hands, dizziness and aches in both arms from the shoulders to the elbows. The crew placed on oxygen via demand valve. Since they were only 20 minutes from shore, the dive operator sent a small boat to take her and her father back to the dock. They were met by emergency medical technicians who continued oxygen administration at 12 liters per minute using a non-rebreather mask. The diver's symptoms did not change during the five minute ride to the hospital. The attending physician performed a thorough neurological evaluation and did not note any deficits. The diver reported that the tingling in her hands was still present and also complained of a tingling sensation in her face. The aching in her arms had not improved, nor had the dizziness. Standard blood tests ruled out any potential causes for her symptoms and a chest x-ray did not reveal any lung injuries or other abnormalities. A breathing rate remained elevated and she appeared quite distressed. The dive had been very shallow and the risk of decompression sickness was virtually non-existent, even considering the rapid ascent. There were, however, few other good explanations for her symptoms. The doctor contacted the local hyperbaric physician. Although neither doctor believed the symptoms represented decompression sickness, in the absence of any other clear diagnosis, they considered treating her in the chamber the safest option. She was transported by ambulance to the hyperbaric chamber, which was approximately 30 minutes away. The hyperbaric physician treated her on US Navy treatment table six. The muscle aches resolved within the first 20 minutes at 18 meters. She became less stressed and her breathing rate slowed to normal. All the tingling resolved as well. She was discharged approximately six hours later with no residual symptoms. In a phone call the next day, she denied any return of symptoms and no further treatment was necessary. The dive profile, as reported, does not represent a risk of decompression sickness. The dive was shallow and witnesses stated that it did not last more than 10 minutes. It is highly unlikely that there was sufficient decompression stress to have precipitated DCS at the time of the rapid ascent. Furthermore, there would have been little or no residual nitrogen left from the previous day's dives. Whether the previous day's dives were contributory or not, however, will never be firmly established. The major concern with rapid ascent is breath holding, leading to a lung overexpansion injury and potentially arterial gas embolism. Based on the diver's presentation and subsequent evaluation, 
her symptoms did not suggest AGE, which typically presents as a stroke. Tingling sensations and muscle aches are among the many signs and symptoms of DCS, but it is unusual for tingling to be present in both hands with DCS. Aches and pain are also potential symptoms, but these are more commonly seen in one arm or occur in larger joints, more often than in muscles. So although DCS was extremely unlikely based on the symptoms, it couldn't be ruled out. No medical imaging or lab tests can confirm DCS. The tests and imaging are useful to exclude other possibilities, but they cannot confirm decompression sickness. In this woman's situation, there was no clear explanation for her symptoms. Hyperventilation can produce tingling in the hands and face, and the doctor did suspect that with her struggling that may have occurred, but it would not explain the persistent ache in the arms. Retrospectively, insufficient exposure, atypical symptoms, and no objective findings exclude decompression sickness as a diagnosis. Some physicians, however, would rather err on the side of caution, and this doctor did consult another physician trained in diving medicine. Probably the most compelling factor for considering chamber treatment in the situation was the fact that treatment constitutes a relatively minimal risk to the patient. Both physicians were of the opinion that it was probably not DCS, but they still wanted to act in the diver's best interest. The fact that muscle aches improved with treatment may support the diagnosis, but does not necessarily confirm it. Breathing 100% oxygen can improve a number of conditions and have an anti-inflammatory effect, and even reduce the aching and pain muscles. In this case, that, time, or the placebo effect may all have been factors that facilitated symptom resolution. Other physicians or facilities may have opted not to treat this dive in the chamber, which would also have been reasonable. Most physicians try to make decisions that are in the best interest of the patient. As always, Dan is available to divers as well as healthcare professionals to assist in the decision-making process.